Now to a House Rules Committee meeting on the Senate version of the Financial Markets Bill. The committee sets the rules for debate on the House floor Friday. The Senate bill passed by a wide margin on Wednesday. It contained several provisions that were not in a similar bill that failed to pass the House Monday. Louise Slaughter of New York chairs the Rules Committee. Committee will please come to order. We're here today to consider the Senate amendments to H.R. 1424, the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008. We're happy to welcome the Chairman of the Financial Services Committee, Mr. Frank, and the committee's ranking member, Mr. Bacchus. Without objection, gentlemen, your full statement will appear in the record. If you so choose, you may summarize. Mr. Frank. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is obviously a meeting all of us had hoped would, or most of us had hoped would not occur. And I really do sincerely wish, without meaning any offense, that we can stop meeting like this. I, I feel the same way. But um, we are in a situation where the House voted a bill down on Monday. I believe that uh, what happened subsequently were the negative consequences that many of us had feared. I uh, note that the Treasurer of California, for example, has sent a letter uh, announcing that his state is running into trouble in what has always been a routine procedure of rolling over notes. The Treasurer of the state, Mr. McGovern and I represent, has said the same thing. A Boston University in the uh, a uh, district that I represent and Mr. Capuano represents announced on Tuesday that they were shutting down construction. Um, there was a concern that this was a proposal that was going to help Wall Street. In fact, uh, the wealthy people on Wall Street and elsewhere in the financial community who are <coughs> culpable of misjudgments in these cases, and in a few instances probably something worse, but generally misjudgments, they're all rich enough to be insulated from the pain that will happen here. What is now happening is what many of us were afraid were ha would happen and what we tried to avoid. A lot of Americans, middle class, working Americans, are getting hurt. When people can't sell cars, when construction sites are, are shut down, when small businesses can't finance their inventories, when the states can't roll over funds to pay the bills to vendors or to pay the uh, salaries of people needed to pay, that's the kind of pain we were trying to avoid. It is clear that it was a series of mistakes made by a lot of people that brought us here, and we can deal later with who made the mistakes. We are certainly, I think, resolved, I know we are resolved next year to work together jointly to deal with these matters. And there are questions ranging from the need to regulate unregulated entities the uh, question of whether or not accounting techniques have what economists call a pro-cyclical effect in which they exacerbate bad effects. Uh, how is it appropriate for the Congress to get into these things? We have a very busy agenda. I am confident that the bad experiences we have all had in the economy and elsewhere are such that uh, there will be a commitment to reform to a degree that we haven't seen before. I know some are pessimistic, I think, unwisely. But the fact is that we are where we are. As I've said before, one of the things that people forget is that solutions cannot be qualitatively more elegant than the problems at which they aim. The messier the problem, the less clean the solution. We have a messy situation that was created by, I believe, a lack of uh, appropriate regulation and irresponsible private behavior. People may have a different mix of it. We all agree we are where we are, and I think it is also clear Doing nothing at all will lead to further shutdowns in this economy of all of those activities that depend on credit. People have focused on the stock market and the ups and downs and the down. And that has problems because we have retirees and others, people close to retirement, who've seen their pensions and 401ks uh, hurt. But we are also talking about people engaged in active economic activity. And the problem is if you are engaged in an economic activity, which requires credit to be extended, you are at risk. 
So it is important for us to act. Uh, this is not a bill that anybody would have written. It is a compromise. There were five parties, House and Senate Democrats, House and Senate Republicans, and the administration. It is, while it did not go through the normal committee process, a bill which has had more input from members than the I've seen. There were constant ongoing caucuses and meetings and sessions. And it wasn't, in fact, in some ways, it was more open than the normal process where only members of the committee have input. This was one where a wide range of members through their respective caucus or conference had some input. Uh, we are in a position where I believe we have to act. Now, the Senate did add two provisions. We had hoped to get them to open the bill up to do more. I believe that this bill has very good language in it that empowers the secretary and in some cases directs him to reduce foreclosures. It directs him to use the role that he will play in buying mortgages and as the federal government runs Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac with the FDIC and the FHA to reduce foreclosures. And I believe the bill will go a long way towards that. I acknowledge that as we wrote it, and here the haste showed elegance and simplicity of language was, was lost. And so it does not, it's not as clear to people what it says. I, as you read that bill, um, I'm reminded of a great comment by Mark Twain that the, the music of Wagner, he said it was better than it sounds. Um, <laughs> this is a bill that, that, that is better than it looks if you uh, read it because it's, it's perhaps a little jargonized and loyally, but it does empower the secretary. Now, we wanted to rewrite it and make that clearer and perhaps add a, a paragraph or two the Senate objected. They said it couldn't be opened. They used their prerogative going last because we had defeated the bill. Had we passed the bill, they wouldn't have had that to add two provisions. One, the uh, increase in the FDIC insurance is widely supported, I believe. Community banks have been the victims of all this. They have been the least culpable of all the financial players. And we have in here provisions that help them with regard to the uh, loss of, uh, of, of, of capital they suffered when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac preferred were devalued. We have an assurance that they will be allowed fully to participate in this program. There's no uh, bigness uh, requirement. And uh, we now have the FDIC insurance increase, which will help keep people from moving funds out of those banks because of the fear that uh, uh, they, they might not be fully uh, insured. So that, I think, is widely supported. The Senate also added the tax extenders, uh, many of which are widely supported again, although there has been a dispute between the House and the Senate about how or whether or not they should be paid for with the, the uh, Fraction on the Democratic side in the House, the Bulldogs caring very strongly about uh, uh, not exacerbating the deficit, being upset. The Senate managed to throw in a couple of controversial items, um, uh, which I regret. But uh, we are faced with this situation. If we do not act soon, and by the way, I do, in our defense, say the Secretary of the Treasury, who I think is very well intentioned in this, and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, told us two weeks ago now my colleague sitting next to me was, was at the meeting, I believe. We were told two weeks ago, almost to, to, to the hour, in the speaker's office in this building, that we had to do this bill over the weekend. So for those who said we're being rushed, no, we did not agree to be rushed. We did not agree that the bill that we were given the concept of on Thursday had to be passed the following Monday. We've worked on it. It will be over two weeks since it was first raised. That's not a lot of time in the legislative process, but if you look at two weeks in which a large number of members and the great blessing we have, our staff, did nothing else but intensively work on this and talk to each other and talk to outside groups. Uh, it cannot be argued, I think, now that the bill did not get a lot of attention, although it would have been better if we could have had some more. Uh, given that, given that Americans who are at work in a variety of occupations are already beginning to suffer and will suffer more if we do nothing, and there will be a slowdown and a meltdown of a lot of activity in which people work, we will uh, lose out. People have said, well, it's only for Wall Street. I, I have here a letter from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, one of the leading advocacy groups for low-income people in the country, saying, please pass this bill. The National Association of Home Builders. People know the home builders know they are culturally and personally and in many ways very different from Wall Street. These are people who are very tangible in what they make. 
they have said this is urgent. The Republican and Democratic Governors Associations uh, said the treasurers of Massachusetts and California, just to take two, uh, a wide variety of people who are in this business. And the automobile industry, in precarious shape, is particularly concerned here because of the centrality of, uh, of, of finance in the automobile industry. So I, uh, I wish the Senate hadn't done what it did. But I wish a lot of things, Madam Chair, and sometimes they come true and sometimes they don't. Um, the power to undo what's been done, I long ago learned, are not very strong. Given the choices we face, I think we have a two-step process. Pass this bill and then begin immediately in hearings we will have later this year and in, in, in votes we will take up next year put into place the kind of preventive measures that will keep this situation from occurring. I thank you for your uh, consideration. Thank you. Mr. Bacchus? Thank you. Uh, Chairman Slaughter and uh, Ranking Member Dreyer, uh, members of the committee, um, Secretary Paulson came to us 15 days ago and announced to, uh, I think, about ten of the members of the House and Senate that, as Chairman Frank said, we had to act and that there was no alternative. Um, I asked him in that meeting, are there no alternatives? And his answer was no. And part of the whole premise for the next 14 days is that we at least from the Secretary of Treasurer, uh, tr uh, was that we didn't have any choices. We proved that wrong. We've made choices. Uh, we have vastly improved this bill from what it was when it started. However, I think we're, I don't think we're there. Let me be honest. And the reason I think that is if you talk to the membership, uh, you find that probably 80% of the membership has serious doubts about what we've done. Now, more important than what our doubts are the American people. And if there's a somewhat a doubt in our mind, or lack of confidence that we're doing everything we can do exactly like it ought to be done. There's a great amount of uh, uncertainty and doubt uh, on behalf of the American people. I think that their, their confidence in us, their trust in us was undermined further by the Port Bell projects that the Senate put in. I think it's outrageous that a time of national emergency that these things would be added. And I don't, do not think that we're powerless. I do not think we have any choice but to go along with the Senate. I think as House members that goes against our pledge of office. I think it goes against our obligation to our constituents. Uh, they are waiting. And I think more importantly the American people are waiting. They're waiting to see what we're going to do about these pork projects. But in certain respects, I think the Senate did America and did this body a favor. Because I think when they added those pork barrel projects, I think they should have, if it didn't push many of us over the brink, and, and say, we can do better. And I submit to you that sometimes the best things are the simple things. The secretary announced to us that they needed $700 billion. At the same time in that meeting that Chairman Frank was in and in subsequent meetings that he and I have been in, uh, they have repeatedly said that they needed $700 billion. They've also said, more importantly, that they could only use $50 billion a month. That was all they could efficiently do, set up the program and that they had no intention of going over $50 billion. Now, these are the same people that said they'd never intervene in Freddie and Fannie. It was a large bazooka that would never be fired. But 
I do have a level of confidence in their expertise. When they tell me that they can only use $50 billion a month, it gives us a wonderful opportunity, both the Senate and the House. And I would like, I believe we can save ourselves from this rush to judgment. I believe that, and, and I will say this, I've talked to Democratic members that have come to me for days, as well as Republican colleagues, and they've all said the same thing. Do we have to have $700 billion now? And the answer is no. The answer is no. They can only use $50 billion a month. And I'm told, well, the market, you know, if we don't appropriate $700 billion and say they can use it all, the market will lack confidence. Well, the, if we, if we, the market will figure out if we take a wiser approach, they will have more confidence in us than if we just write a blank check for $700 billion. Now, I say blank check. It's no longer a blank check. Thank to Chairman Frank. Thank to, to uh, members on both sides of the aisle. There is a tremendous amount of oversight and disclosure now. So I don't want to understate that. I would have never voted for that original bill. Now, here's what we can do. And, and I'm talking about all of us together. We're coming back on November, in November, I think it's the 7th, 17th. 17th. Now, we have to trust, to a certain extent, my level of trust is not where it ought to be. Let me admit that. But if they tell us they need $50 billion a month, why in the world are members on both sides of the aisle being exposed to what I consider a reckless, if not imprudent, decision of appropriating $700 billion? We can come back here on November the 17th. We can look at the first $100 billion out the door. We, and we can examine Number one, how it's being done, the procedures, the policies, the safeguards. We can get, and we, and more importantly, the, Amer the American people will by then have a level of confidence in the market in what they're doing or they won't. I advocated, I think, a safer alternative all this week, and that was covered bonds. I'm willing to, you know, as the chairman says, he's advocated things. We ever, everybody, we know it's time to quit advocating those things and take some action to free up our credit markets, which are actually more important than our stock market. That's a bigger problem than our stock market. People watching the Dow every day, is, it's a mistake. You ought to watch uh, the credit uh, figures and the credit statistics, and they're, they're terrible. They're terrible. <clears throat> and, and businesses will continue to go out of business until we do something. But we can, we can meet between now and November. We can have discussions. We can have hearings. And we can decide. We can approve. We can authorize $700 billion. And we can allow 250 and that's what Mr. Lasserette proposed. And, so, and, and he has talked to Democrats as well as Republicans. I would have proposed $150 billion. We can allow that to be spent. We can then come back here in November, and instead of this thing where we have to affirmatively, uh, I mean, we have to stop them by passing legislation, what we ought to do, we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about $700 billion in the last uh, $450 billion of that. We come back, and we ought to have to positively say, and we'll all have, we, we, there will be so much more we'll know. <coughs> today than we know, you know, than we know now. We'll know how it's working. We'll know what the markets are like. And then we can approve the balance. And if we voted no then, it would be because we didn't think it was the right thing to do. If we voted yes, I think the markets, the American people, would have much greater confidence in us then if we just said we have no alternative, we have 15 days, that's not true. We don't have 15 days. We, we can pass $250 billion to do today. The Senate's in town. They can ratify it, and I believe they will. 
In fact, I believe we'll get a vote of about 65 to 70 percent of the body if we'll do this. And let's take out the pork. We didn't put it in. It's not ours. The American people don't want it there. They're offended by the sensibilities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bacchus. Uh, I, I think all of us uh, share the absolute anger. I, I'm absolutely appalled that right here at the end of the session uh, that Secretary of Treasury and the head of the Fed didn't notice that this was going on. And that the first notice that we have, it's a really serious problems here that have to be acted on immediately was a week or two weeks ago. Um, and, but I also know that if you've lost your arm and you're bleeding to death, that the first thing you have to do is stop the bleeding with a tourniquet and then later you can stitch that up. I see that as what Mr. Frank is recommending by uh, doing what we have to do now and then immediately, as I understand it, the hearings will start next week, Mr. Frank, is that correct? Yes, um, Mr. Waxman will be having some oversight hearings. We will be having some hearings. In fact, the uh, uh, ranking member just sent me a letter that I got today uh, urging that we have some hearings on the accounting issues, which are important issues, but there's some delicacy. You know, I don't think any of us want us to legislate accounting, but we want to do the right oversight. Um, uh, the, the credit default swaps issues that people think we should, you know, at least have the kind of hearings that will deter things uh, from, from going wrong until we can legislate them. I do want to respond, if I could, Madam Chair. Of course. The proposal that the uh, ranking member alluded to of $250 billion is one that uh, we in the House pressed very strongly, particularly the, the House Democrats. Uh, the uh, Treasury Department absolutely said this would be terrible and would frustrate it, and they were supported uh, particularly by uh, the Senate Republicans. I mean, you know, I don't, this isn't partisan, it's just to identify who was there. And uh, there was the feeling that... Uh, we got from the Senate Democratic leadership that given the nature of the Senate, it would not be possible to do this unless there was <coughs> bipartisan agreement and they had to have a kind of, you know, they, they, they could veto each other and then throw in a little on the side, as we know. Um, but um, it was, uh, we were told that neither, that because the administration objected so strongly, the Senate would not pass a bill that included that. So I very much agree. I think the, uh, that was our original proposal, in fact, to, uh, you know, I, I'm not claiming both of you, but you know, pretty simple idea. You get it in, in, in chunks. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, we were told, as I said, by the administration of the Senate, they wouldn't pass it that way. Uh, they let me, they wouldn't I, sign it that way, you said? That they wouldn't sign it in... Uh, Unless it was the, the Senate whole Senate 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 said, The Senate said they wouldn't accept it that way in the negotiations that we had. I think back if I could respond. Yeah. Yes. Let me, let me say this. I, I have great respect for Chairman Frank. I, I have even greater respect for him after the last 15 days. I really do, and his intellect. Uh, where we disagree is what we have the power to do. Uh, the chairman said, and I, I agree, that all of us in the House believe that we should do something less than $700 billion. Mm -hmm. We all agree. And we, we are told, at, we're told that the Senate Republicans, hey, they don't vote in the House. Now, I will, I will, my memory is different. He, the chairman gave a very funny illustration, which I think is true, and, and he told the story of a steamboat that went around the bend, and it disappeared, and it sank. And he said there was no way to figure out what happened because there were too many survivors. Let me, let me give credit where credit is due. That was Washington Irving in the Knickerbocker history. <laughs> it sounded like a New Yorker. Yeah. Now, I, said, I said in all those meetings, and uh, I, we talked about that. I had no authority, as you but well read, to negotiate, but I did make, as the chairman said, thoughtful comment. Yes. Yeah. And one of my comments was that we don't need to do it all. We don't need to do it all. And the chairman said that. Right. We and the said senator that. said that on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. And. One of the things we asked in one of the meetings was, how much can you spend? And he said, I would like authority to spend up to $50 billion a month. And I, I would, it's my opinion, I would respectfully disagree. I believe if we, and we're authorizing full $700 billion, but we're going to say we're going to see how it works. Well, I, the, 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 the Treasury came back, and, and Secretary Paulson said, 
the the market needs a measure of confidence. This is this is a, a what we propose, and, and I don't, it doesn't have to be Steve's plan. I think he's courageous for stepping out. Uh, there are a lot of other members that would like to say, let's do something more prudent, more careful. It can be 200, it can be 150, that would have been my choice. It's all they can spend through December. Let me just add one. The, the secretary never asked for it to If be, we believe what they say. He predicted $50 billion a month. He didn't ask for that. But I, in the, the, yes, there was a lot of congressional support for that. Treasury came back and said, we can't live with it. And the Senate Republicans supported them and, 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 during, during, and said, you know, and, and we were then told, yeah, that the Senate, Senate leadership said, well, we can't get the bill through without a bipartisan agreement. I know that our intent here always was to do 250. Yeah. Um, so that, again, yeah, they, they, when I left the meetings and was pulled out, the general agreement was we were going to do $250 billion. Now, I'm going to say this. Let's not be tricked. You know, we know the American people may not realize the difference in positively or negatively having to pass a law. But, but there's none of the members of the House or Senate that know, don't know the significance of the difference between what Mr. Lasserette and some of his Democratic colleagues have proposed. You, I've heard Democratic members. When it came back and it said, we'll have to pass a law to stop this, I heard Democrats and Republicans. I heard the media. I heard people in the marketplace. I heard say, oh, yeah. That's tough to do. That you know, how about a you know, you may have to face a presidential veto. We need listen. We owe it to the American people. We're 250 billion is a staggering amount of money. And let me and, and I have asked this question for two weeks, and I don't want to and and we have a sovereign rating of of we have a triple A sovereign rating. I asked on the, on the Fannie and Freddie, which I think was, was something that uh, you know, we did, and it, we, let's not go back to what we did. But we spent 200 or 300 billion there. There were people that were concerned that it, that might undermine our credit rating. It didn't, thank goodness. But we can't continue to spend hundreds of billions of dollars and, it's not, and, and meet our obligations to seniors for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, infrastructure. and. In November, we will know whether this plan's working and working well. And we listen, if we come back and it's working well, I don't know, you know, I even think you'll get a bigger vote than you get now. And the American people will be behind it. But, but what if it's not working? What if we need to do something else to help Main Street? I take great comfort in the fact that the GAO is going to be in the Treasury. I think that's one of the brightest things Mr. Frank did. Second, everything has to be absolutely transparent. It has to be reported at the time that it's done. I mean, this is so much better than Secretary Paulson saying, give me the money and leave me alone. It is, it is. And there's one very important point. I, 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 I thought my colleague was kind of suggesting that this might impinge on the credit rate of the United States. I'd like to repudiate that suggestion. Um, no, the United States isn't going to default on anything. No one should think that, uh, uh, you know, we've got the full taxing power. That doesn't mean we can be reckless about debt. But I wouldn't want there to be any suggestion that there was any possibility that the American government was going to default on, mm. on its, on its uh, full obligations. That would be A, wrong, and B, damaging of people. No, and what I'm saying is that our credit rating, there's a credit rating, and it affects our ability to borrow, well, no, I, not to borrow, but, but at the price we Well, here's where I would object. There is no, look, these rating agencies have their own bad record. The full faith and credit of the United States government is unshakable. And I'm not prepared. We, we, that doesn't mean we should or shouldn't do this. But it's it not unlimited, mean. Chairman. It is unlimited in the sense it's limited by our own capacity, our own decision. But no, people are not going to, the United States government is not going to default. And I think you make a great mistake if you suggest that to people. I didn't, I didn't suggest All right, then we agree. I'm, I'm it's sorry. Not, it's not I, a fact. I, but I would say also. I will uh, suggest this. Oh, let me, during the sure. debate, during the debate, both candidates were saying, okay, what are you going to cut? And there will be cuts. Now, if this program is working in November, we can authorize the additional amounts if it is working and we feel like it's a better, it working better than something else. Let me uh, respond here. First of all, again, is another mistake. Yes, it's going to cost some money. It's not going to cost anything like 
700 billion or 250 billion. We are buying things and we're going to resell them. Right. Let's not give false fears to people. I, 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 Secondly, well, let me finish because there was a suggestion we're going to spend 700 billion dollars and our credit rating is being trouble. And neither of those were true. That doesn't make it not a tough decision. As to holding it, yes, I, I'm very supportive. If the Senate were willing to do this, that would be fine. But again, and we, many of us made that argument for cutting it back. The Senate Republicans finally, after consulting with the Treasury, said we won't pass it. Now, it may be that uh, they might change their mind. What we're also told is it would take a couple of weeks, a week at least, and maybe more. And uh, I don't think that the risk to the economy is, uh, is there, especially if in the end we're going to vote for it anyway. So uh, I, that was something we preferred. But at this point, where we are, to take the risk of this bill either not being voted on or voted down and not passing or having, even if it passed, having to go back to the Senate for another week, two or whatever, um, <coughs> and uh, getting in a dispute about some of these other factors, I believe will uh, add to the very strong likelihood that there'll be uh, a lot more innocent economic victims. I think there is today. I just read that the Education Department had to pick up $41 million in college loans from uh, Wachovia. Uh, there's something about MetLife. I missed the whole thing, but it's spreading now to insurance companies. Uh, but uh, the, the market anticipates that we're going to take an action. Mm -hmm. We can do, we can appropriate all the money they can spend for the next four months. And we can then consider alternatives. Well, uh, you know, we, we've, I mean, I, we've all heard that we've all, I think everybody in this room agrees that we would have rather done $250 billion. Uh, I, I, and I will close with this. You'll never convince me that we pull out these pork barrel projects. And if we lose a senator over there because it was his pork barrel project or hers, so be it. You know, there's, and we're, you know, then they can stand up and face the American people and their constituents. Mm -hmm. If they pull it out because they <clears throat> think that we're, we're addressing the problem, they're not going to pull it out because we're still allowing the Treasury to do everything it said it was going to do this year. Well, yes. Thank you, sir. It's That's not a case of losing one senator. Because we're going to have yeah. a new administration. It's not a case of losing one senator. It's a case of sending it back to the Senate with a and week or more delay, why. and then innocent victims uh, proliferate. But this, by no means, is any perfect bill. Nobody in the world, I think 100% uh, people on Earth would probably agree to that. We're not doing anything about swaps and derivatives and hedge funds and all the rest of that mishmash that's out there, unregulated, nobody's going to want to do so That's why these hearings are important. We have to have some thoughtful hearings and understanding of what all this is. Absolutely, and let's not tie our hands, it. Chairman. So that's what we want to do. Uh, at the beginning of the next term is to have the legislation ready to go uh, so that we can not have this ever happen again, or at least until somebody else comes in who believes that deregulation is the only way to go. And well, we, we should get we out may, of the way of great business because they know what they're doing. We may decide in those hearings, or the majority of us may decide that, that um, we could do this a little better or that there are some other alternatives on the table or that some of this money should go for something else. In fact, I proposed, starting a week and a half ago, that some of the $700 billion be used, the, the uh, financial institutions, the, the community banks and credit unions are going to have to pay additional uh, money for, for insurance. I felt like we at least should consider part of that $700 billion going to those mainstream banks because they're going to receive very little benefit of this overall package. But we, we have, we, let us, let us discuss, let us give them all the money they can use this year, and that's, then let's see how it works. Let's well, we see how they that. design. We did that. We are, well, we but if we, if we don't it. like what we see, or yeah. if we want to change what we see, we may face a presidential veto. But if we don't get that tourniquet on, we just may bleed to death. Mr. McGovern? Um. First of all, thank you both for being here again, and thank you for your um, dedication to trying to work something out. I have to tell you that it's a little bit frustrating sitting here and listening to this. And I, I have a bad case of whiplash 
because I, if I'm not, I thought you voted for the bill, Mr. Farkas, on Monday. Um, and, uh, you know, and here we are. Uh, and, and, you know, and look, I don't like the fact that the Senate added things to the bill, the tax cuts that aren't paid for. I, I, I wish they didn't do that. I don't want to add to the debt anymore. I wish they didn't do that. But they did that because we gave them the opportunity. We failed on Monday. Uh, we didn't have the votes to pass. We were 12 votes short. Um, and then when it failed, um, Speaker Pelosi had a press conference, and Minority Le uh, Leader Boehner had a press conference, and everybody's going to regroup and come back together and, and see what we can do to get the votes, to get this thing done, because this is urgent. The day after we passed the vote, the market went way down. Um, and the market's not doing that well today either. Um, but a lot of us, you know, and, and this, and this, and if I had any, I voted yes. I trusted everybody. And I think it was, and, I, and in retrospect, when I went home, I actually think it was the right vote. Because when I went home, um, one of the things that I heard over and over in these last couple of days was that now small businesses are feeling the crunch. Um, our, our state government is in a panic because they can't get credit. Um, and, you know, people who, Previously, was saying vote no, and now saying I was saying vote yes because they see there's an impending crisis coming, and so, you know, I think anybody who thinks that nothing will happen if we do nothing hasn't been home. The last Jim, Jim, days. I, yeah. nothing I said minimized the challenges this economy is facing, and nothing I said didn't say that we should not be trying to. That it's 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 to the benefit of all Americans to free up these I, I guess, impaired assets. Well, what well, I did let, say let me, let me, let me ask is that all they can spend is two hundred billion dollars. Here's my here's my question. I mean, is there any impact on the economy if we delay for ten days? We wouldn't be delayed. We we could oh, no, we, we, we could pass say, this you know, with you know, this amendment. I'm, I'm, we could. I'm going to tell you that you know if I were the market watching us, you know. It was predicted that we were going to pass this in the House on Monday. We didn't. Everybody was stunned. The Senate passes it overwhelmingly yesterday, and then the news is saying that the House is going to, will, will obviously pass it. I saw a, a, an article that appeared in, a, in, a, in the Hill saying White House House bailout vote switching to yes. So, you know, the psychology of all this is that, you know, we're, we're, about, to, we're about to pass with the Senate. We don't pass that tomorrow. You know, I mean, where is the confidence that we can do anything? Well, we know that we can we, we can pass it by a larger majority. There are at least 10 members that have said with this amendment on it, they will join with us. We know with certainty that if this amendment goes on it, that we will pass it. I think, and all of us have agreed tonight that it's a better bill with it on there. And then it goes back to the Senate, and there's absolutely no chance that they are going to vote this down. I think it will actually, uh, we're stripping out a few pork barrel projects and we're adding some prudence and restraint and we're not, we're, we are. We were told on Monday there was and no chance to help. This is a massive I, usurping of well, the I, legislative said, authority without this. Well, I, I, and I, as I said, I don't understand why to my colleague it was okay to do this on Monday and not uh, tomorrow in terms of the 700 billion, and I also, um, it, it's at least a week of delay. Even if the Senate passes it, the Senate, well, the gentleman says no, but the Senate rules are such, and any one person can object and hold it up, and uh, you're talking about at least a week's delay in the Senate. And uh, if they were to make a further change, because they might put back some of the extenders, they might disagree with us of which ones come in, then it comes back here and we have a further delay. So uh, there's no assurance if we don't pass this on Friday that we aren't gonna have to wait uh, one, two, three weeks. No senator stood up and objected to it coming up. And that's because- uh, And, 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 and if we take they out their it. pork barrel project and they stand up and they object, they will not be in the Senate. Well, there were some senators who weren't going to be in the, excuse me, but there were some senators who weren't going to be in the Senate no matter what happens. A lot of them are leaving. Uh, that's just a confidence that, that, that has no basis. Well, let me just say, I, I think we leave here and do, don't do anything this week. Uh, you know, good luck going home. I mean, I think people are, are getting fed up with, 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 the, with, with what is perceived as our inability to get our act together and do something. Well, I mean, Jim, the economy is at the brink. Can I just uh, add, by the way, there. Senator McCain, who's made a career of... Uh, being very critical in part of, of uh, what he describes as pork bell, uh, voted for this bill. And I think that is an indication of uh, that it's not going to be any, any uh, <coughs> slam dunk to undo much of what they did. And I think ultimately it would pass. But I don't think it is healthy to have the economy go through another week or two of this kind of turmoil. Well, uh, let me say this, Chairwoman. 
we're a democracy. And uh, I believe that the 435 members of this body and the, the American people deserve an up or down vote on this amendment. Well, look, look, and and if, we are if democracy, Jim, if, we, if we are you... We a democracy and we can do whatever hey, we, we want or we, or we can do nothing. If but you, I'll tell you, there are 435 members of this House. Every one of us have 435 different ways to solve this problem. I'm saying this... I, listen. Well, I would just say also, if you're going to open this up, I think the foreclosure prohibition language ought to be toughened up. Right. If we are, we, if we do we have the opportunity to make changes, yeah, there are other changes that I'd like to make. I, I, I acknowledge well, we all I'm agree on this change. We, we have said. No, excuse me. I'd like to finish. Yeah, but frankly, if I had to choose, reducing foreclosures is more important than phasing the money because I think in the end that's not going to make a great deal of difference. I think they're going to get the same amount of money in the end anyway. I agree that it'd be better to do it this way, but I think that is frankly, a little bit more cosmetic than as compared to reducing the number of foreclosures. So if we're going to reopen it up, I will tell you on the Democratic side, there are a large number of people who say, look, you tried and you made it a little better. We think you can make some improvements. And so if it opens up, it's opened up. And there's no way you can open it up just for one, uh, w one particular side. And I agree. I mean, if we, if we open this up, then I'd like to have this reflect more of my values and what my concerns Well, you know, all our values are reflected by doing this according to what I've heard. Thank Not nearly and, as and, much and, as foreclosures. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Dry. That's a decision. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, it's great to see that we've all come to a wonderful agreement here and are going to be able to proceed uh, expeditiously. Um, I think everyone does acknowledge that something needs to be uh, be done. Uh, the people whom I represent in Southern California are uh, enraged over the prospect of million-dollar-a-month salaries over the prospect of uh, golden parachutes being continued to, to uh, be granted to the people who have uh, got us into this. And I look at, uh, I look at the uh, package that's been put here by our colleague, Mr. Sherman. He says still tens of billions to the Bank of China, a million dollar a month salaries. And it was my sense that these things were addressed uh, in the, the tax provisions that are provided and imposed on those who, in fact, would... Uh, would be uh, establishing those kinds of things. And so I, uh, I just want to say that I think there's a real misunderstanding out there on the part of a lot of people as to what this consists of. And I think you're both correct in pointing to the fact that this is not just a question of the stock market, it's a question of credit. And, uh, you know, the overwhelming number of calls that have come to my office have been from people who say, uh, you know, don't reward the fat cats. And that's what we continue to hear. But, the thing that uh, has also come in has been uh, a mother who called at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning and left a message for fear that she wouldn't be able, she couldn't sleep because she didn't know how she was going to get a student loan for her daughter to go to college. Or the small businessman who's called and uh, made it very clear that um, he doesn't know he's going to be payroll because his line of credit, in fact, has been uh, reduced. So we have uh, an urgency here. Uh, this needs to be addressed. And I'd just like to, you all to comment on the things that a lot of people believe are still in this measure. Uh, lack of oversight, the, uh, again, the golden parachutes and all that because... Uh, well, the, the pork barrel is in there, and it has outraged the American people. You know, that, that uh, the Senate, at a time of national emergency, would do something so self-serving and selfish. And... We can take it out with this amendment. Uh, there are, there's a lot of misinformation and rumor out there. I reviewed about 18 emails earlier this morning, and more than half of them contain things that my, they were from my constituents. They thought were, were in this bill, and they never were. The rumors are, are, are out there. But that's why I say appropriate a third of the money now basically, and come back, and between now and then, we take our case to the American people. Jim, I think we ought to go home. I think we ought to pass this. I think we ought to pass it with this amendment. Then I think we ought to go home and answer the wrath of our, of, uh, our constituents. And I will tell you that I returned home uh, Tuesday night uh, and stayed about eight hours, and it was not a very pleasant experience. Uh, but, you know, I'm willing to face that challenge. I'm, I, I vote yes. I voted yes. People have indicated I'm confused. You voted yes. I voted yes 
because my only choice between, was between inaction and action. You as a rules committee tonight can make a choice between uh, what I consider a much more uh, appropriate, uh, a reasoned approach that all every member of the House says ought to be done. I've, I've not heard anybody stand up and say that this is not better than, than the $700 billion. Well, maybe there is somebody. But, but you know, at least earlier, this, the chairman and I were on the same page. We stood side by side and advocated yes. for this. Well, let me say, Frank. no, I think it would be better. I do think you are exaggerating the importance of it because I think if we, might, I think it's more than likely they'd wind up with the same amount of money. Um, I think it would make people feel better in terms of democracy. Uh, but if we were going to make changes, it wouldn't be the biggest change for me. And I, uh, I as I said, that. foreclosure prohibition is, uh, is, is one. Now, also on what the uh, ranking member said, the golden parachutes, we do have language in that to restrict them. For Now, people say they can still get a million a month. True. I mean, if a company has had this salary structure, they keep it up, we don't change that. We do say if you're getting aid from this, even if you're selling it in an auction, uh, the secretary is instructed to say no golden parachutes. As to the Bank of China, I think that's a uh, red herring. Um, the, uh, it assumes that, that the secretary of the Treasury, this one or future ones, would really be uh, ignorant of American interests. Um, we have limited what foreign banks can do. The uh, notion is, well, they do this kind of uh, lateral and they'd slip it in and the secretary wouldn't notice it. Um, I think the secretary is, is right there that he's dealing with assets that have uh, been involved in America, that are in America. And uh, in fact, we don't want to say that foreign investment isn't welcome here. Foreign investment has played an important role for us. In fact, people have asked me what I thought about sovereign wealth funds. And most recently, my problem with them was they stopped making bad investments in America. We were doing pretty good with them buying stuff that we were profiting from. So I think the Secretary has acted uh, uh, prudently there. You could tighten up the language on compensation if we opened it. That's something we could do. It is precedent setting. This will be the first time in American history that Congress has gotten involved in these kind of limitations. And particularly with golden parachutes, we have told the Secretary to formulate language that prevents them from the uh, companies getting aid. Well, gentlemen, yes. no, of course I have is uh, the provision still in the bill that if they want to pay um, <laughs> huge monthly salaries, they cannot deduct They can't them. deduct more than $400,000 per year if they're getting aid. More they than can still pay them, but okay. the, the tax deduction is, is 500, 500. 500 Yeah, Madam Chairman, there, there are a number of very positive things that this mm -hmm. body did. Uh, one thing that the chairman said, let me agree with him. I believe as a... As he feels so strongly about some of these things. Let us appropriate. We, we all, I think, no, we don't all, but, but a good majority, I believe, thinks that something ought to be done and that it is going to be this program to unfree assets. I think that's a given. The Senate said by 70 to 30 or some, some uh, margin. But we have also said, all of us have said, we would have done something different. We have that opportunity. If you really strongly believe that and believe you could have done it better, we can come back in November well, and do it. And we can have 100 amendments. You can have your amendments on foreclosure. Thank you. I can have my amendment on covered bonds. But if we pass this tonight, you can, you know, well, you, I just say this won't happen. The fact is that tranching this and requiring a second vote doesn't make any fundamental, it makes no difference to the program. It does give us a chance to say, you're going to go back and I'm for that. But we shouldn't kid ourselves that this in any way transforms the program. It will still be the same program uh, spent for the first several months at the same pace. It does say later on, if we think it's uh, messed up, we can change it more easily than we otherwise could. But everything else about this program would be exactly the same. What I hear the chairman say is it would be an improvement and we ought to make that improvement. Uh, I'll have to bring you around to make what I'm saying clearer and quicker. Are you finished, Mr. Hastings? Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Frank, are there any implications in this measure with reference to the rating systems of uh, Moody's? Or no, we are dealing with that uh, and plan to deal with it in other legislation. Uh, this does not do a lot of the regulation. We have, for instance, a bill that's passed out of committee uh, that we'll have to get back to next year that tries to change the system, and I think this was largely, uh, it, was, it was supported widely. We believe that municipalities that are issuing full faith and credit uh, uh, paper are being unduly penalized. Uh, ironically, they were told to get bond insurance, 
So they got bond insurance, and then their insurers took the premiums that they were getting from the cities, went and dabbled in these exotic instruments, and then the, the, the insurance company's ratings were lowered, and that dragged down the municipality. So we worked very closely, bipartisan, to deal with that. We have other legislation, and when we get yeah, back here next year. the first time I heard anything uh, about it, and um, it, it just uh, came to my attention. Madam Chair, I have so many things to say until I think it more prudent not to say anything at this time and would encourage, um, among other things, um, uh, the presenters here for amendments that have already presented amendments to be mindful that we have heard them and um, are fully aware of uh, their arguments. I would also like to say, uh, not so much in defense of the Senate, for I think I have been, as have all of us at different times, critics of measures in the other body. But I do not consider the alternative minimum tax uh, to be pork, and I do not consider raising the FDIC uh, limits, which we have done um, uh, twice in five years, and the Senate has categorically rejected and now has uh, seen some wisdom in measures that we had undertaken. I do not consider that to be uh, pork, and I certainly don't consider are uh, taking care of uh, people who have mental health problems um, uh, uh, as uh, pork. So everything that they did was not pork. And, and Congressman, none of this amendment does not uh, do anything to change those. We did not consider those pork either. Thank you, Madam. You're very welcome, Mr. Diaz Ballard. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, I thank uh, our two uh, distinguished colleagues for their presentation, their hard work. One thing I'd like to reiterate that uh, Chairman Frank said, uh, I very, uh, very much agree with and think that uh, since the world is watching, it was very appropriate for him to have said it. Uh, the United States will not default on its obligations. Uh, the uh, obligations of the United States government are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. And that's something that I think we on a bipartisan basis should reiterate. Uh, I think since we in the House defeated the legislation as it was before us uh, on Monday, some important improvements have occurred. Uh, a major objective that I think we all share is to see an increase in liquidity in the banking system. Uh, when the FDIC, uh, the limits are raised for uh, uh, depositors uh, in terms of what is insured by the FDIC, uh, that helps the banks uh, with liquidity because it helps uh, depositors uh, have confidence. Uh, obviously, very few people have more than $100,000. Uh, in an, for an account, but small businesses, many small businesses do. Uh, you know, they meet payroll, they, they have many obligations, and often have more than $100,000 in an account. The fact that now they see that up to $250,000 uh, will be uh, insured helps liquidity, uh, helps the banks. Obviously, the banks have to compete now, as, as is our system. Uh, to, to offer the consumer uh, um, interesting uh, reasons for uh, choosing one bank over another, but it'll help. It'll help. Uh, the FDIC measure will help with uh, the objective that we all share, increasing liquidity into the banking system, as, the, as also the uh, SEC's uh, change of the market to market, the accounting change. That also, uh, I'm told by uh, people who are ex expert in the, in the banking system will, will help banks with liquidity. So we've made improvements just by virtue of the fact, in my view, that the legislation was not accepted on Monday. Uh, I see a number of colleagues here uh, who are going to present amendments, ideas for further improvements of the legislation. I have seen the uh, uh, amendment by Mr. Lauderette uh, that uh, has already just received much discussion. I thank Mr. Lauderette for uh, making, uh, for putting together that work product. I support that amendment. I hope that this committee makes it in order. Because I think that the legislation can be further improved. 
but having said that, and in the spirit of my dear friend and colleague, uh, Congressman Hastings of Florida, uh, who said that uh, perhaps some comments should be deferred uh, as we listen to those ideas of the colleagues before us, uh, I simply reiterate my gratitude to the two colleagues uh, who have uh, testified. Yes, uh, Mr. Thank you. First of all, I'm glad you reiterated the point about our, 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 the, the absolute trustworthiness of the American. Uh, there's something odd about some of these rating agencies that haven't exactly been the best performers in the world <laughs> rating the United States government's uh, willingness to pay. The other thing is, and I know you understand this, but I think others, I don't want anyone else less who's following it less closely to get the wrong idea. The mark to market improvements, and I agree the improvements, came from the SEC. They're not in the yes. legislation. Oh, yes. Yeah, we be, but, uh, I mean, and, 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 my point, and, and my point is that by virtue of the fact that we... We that encourage we, them. We encourage them, that I think it was an inducement yes. you know, when they saw what happened on Monday in the House. Thank you very much. Ms. Masui? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm not going to prolong this, but to say that, um, you know, you were absolutely right, that is not the stock market. It is really the credit market, in essence. And that is what we do every single day <coughs> in doing business. And that's what I'm talking about as far as my neighbors in Sacramento. It's the, it's the guy who, who, in essence, couldn't make payroll, so he let go 20 people. You know, in the sense that the car dealerships are going out of business because people can't get loans to buy cars and they let people go. And my feeling is that we can keep perfecting this and perfecting this and perfecting this, and it will take a long time. We do have a crisis. I don't like having to do this, but we have a crisis. And I believe the American people, however they're reacting to this, expect us to act. And quite frankly, the fact is every single day we're getting news about the state of California, Massachusetts, um, our cities and our counties that are having difficulties too. And People work there, too, in essence. And so, quite frankly, I don't believe, and I respect the Senate, and some of the things they put on there are good things. We passed a lot of these things before out of the House. A couple of things I didn't like. But having said that, it's essentially the bill that we had before. It's a little bit better because of certain things they add on to it, like FDIC and all that. But right now, I don't think we can open up something, because you know what happens, because I want my things in there, too. And we pass it over to the Senate. They'll want to add things in there, too. And we'll down two, three weeks down the road. And amazingly, the American people will say then, what are you doing? And every single day, we're going to get some bad news. We do have a credit crisis. And it is the, the stuff behind the stock market that people may not realize. And I feel, for that reason, that we can't just keep pursuing perfection and start ping-ponging back and forth. Because as of this time, I feel that we need to decide to do something and do it. Uh, and I think, it's a, I think it's a better bill than it was when the secretary brought over. We made a lot of improvements with the oversight and the CEO uh, limitations on pay and the whole thing. And I think it's time now to just move ahead. So I thank you very much for the work that both of you have done. And, um, but I think we can keep listening forever and still not come to some conclusion. Um, and sometimes I'm afraid we will. Yeah. Uh, I, I share many of your concerns. I, I really do. And, and if this wasn't something that I felt 90% like of the body supported, I wouldn't bring it. If it were a, an amendment that would divide us or would slow it up or would... But, but we've all said, I mean, no, most everyone has said this is something that we all agree on. And... That's the type of amendment I believe we ought to vote on the floor. Mr. Hastings? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Let me just kind of set the, the stage here. This is a process committee. We don't decide the policy that you have been talking about. We simply set the means by which uh, this, this bill will be debated on the floor. So we're a process uh, committee. And Mr. Bacchus, you were talking about an amendment I believe that Mr. La Tourette uh, has introduced or made available just this afternoon. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I looked at it, but you have talked at length uh, about this. I see Mr. La Tourette here, and I assume he'll go into much greater detail. But the three, the three main points I, I see to that is that uh, the La Tourette Amendment would reduce the amount of money appropriated. Uh, to yeah, well, appropriate, yeah, yeah. Well, let, me, let me go through the... And, whatever time frame 
uh, that is manageable, number one. Number two, it takes care of, uh, uh, at least addresses some earmarks that were in the extenders bill that the Senate sent over. And thirdly, it changes in the future negative action to positive action of the uh, of the Congress. Those are, and there may be more to it because the amendment was just introduced. No, that's it. That's an accurate. Uh, those, those are the three, the, the three things. And what you're really asking them, not to go into details as to how long and what uh, figure, and we're going to be back in November, is simply for, the, you're asking this Rules Committee to give the whole House an opportunity to debate and vote on that proposition. And you're saying that in the sense that uh, we are the people's house, uh, and therefore uh, this is as, as important as this issue is, that opportunity should be afforded all the other members that don't have the opportunity to, as we do, to hear uh, some details, but it shouldn't be on the floor. Am I essentially correct in that? That's absolutely right. And, and I will tell you that, that our Democrats and Republicans in this body have expressed outrage over those uh, pork barrel projects, and they've expressed great in, uh, uh, concern uh, about appropriating the whole $700 billion when it's a brand new proposal and we can't stop it once we appropriate it, as much as we may dislike it. And to make that decision when it's absolutely unnecessary is, uh, is to me, it's reckless. I, uh, I, I yield back. Mr. Cardoza. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm seeing that the bells are ringing. I don't know if we have a vote on it. I'll try to make it as brief as possible, but I think that it's very important that we put a couple of things on the table. First of all, I was very offended by some of the actions that the Senate did as well. Um, there's been a number of us that wanted to pay for that extender bill. Uh, we passed that to this house twice paid for. Uh, they added it. Some of it not paid for, although the, the energy portion was paid for, the other portions were not, and that was a highly expensive to a number of the members. Um, having said that, I believe what Mr. Frank said is ab absolutely operational. That at this point, if any amendment were to be made in order by this committee, that we would delay this bill by at least a week. And I'm very concerned about that because I believe that the economy is on fire. And the longer we take to put it out, the more damage we are letting have happen and ripple through our economy. Uh, I talk to small business people and small bankers, and um, I've gotten a letter today from Governor Schwarzenegger from California who indicated that very soon the state of California will not be able to pay its teachers. Mr. Lockyer uh, is also in concurrence with that. You hear from every state in the country, you hear from every municipality. My district, my district in California is ground zero for this crisis. We were the first to get hit, and I think Mr. Giscolart and I might debate this, but I believe that we're the worst in the country. 12% uh, of my constituents have lost their home to date. And I projected, based on what I can see, what's in foreclosure so far, that 25% of my constituents will have lost their home by the summer of next year. It is extremely, extremely urgent that we get on with fixing the economy so we can put out this fire. I do believe, Madam Chair, sometimes as I sit here on this committee, and this is not to disparage any of my colleagues who well, but I do believe sometimes that if this building were on fire, it may take us a week to debate how to put out the blaze. Um, I'm very concerned about the delay. And I just want to close with this one last statement. Karen Hughes, uh, who was an advisor to President Bush and was one of his speechwriters, said last night on uh, one of the news programs, that she recalls a story of a gentleman who lived during the Great Depression. He was a shirt maker, and he felt that when all those crooks on Wall Street, the Great Depression, did what they did to this country, that they should all just be left to go down uh, in flames of their own. You know, there should be no intervention. And one year later, he had lost his own shirt and was standing on the street in a suit line. 
And he recounted to her, as my understanding, that when he finally got around to thinking about it, he wished that he hadn't been so brash to suggest that everybody just go down, because he ended up be bearing the brunt of the problems that had happened on Wall Street. So I believe it's very important to react. I don't like a lot of this bill. Uh, I said that when I voted for it last time. I hate even more that we're having the situation where we have to accept this bill. We uh, amendments, but frankly, by our not acting the other day, we have allowed the Senate to take this action. And so, Madam Chair, I'm very concerned that we need to, in fact, um, uh, do this, and I don't let anyone comment if it needs to. Let me say this I don't think that uh, they had to act anyway, and I assume that when they acted, they would have done what they did yesterday. No, they would have just accepted what we did. Well, let me, let me say this. I agree with you with the urgency and, and the need to act. Uh, I simply believe that we, we appropriate all the money they can use. Well, I, I've said it all, but uh, let me. Yep. You, you can do something about those pork barrel projects. I think it'd be good. Of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Sessions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I beg your pardon. Okay. Uh, you know, the, le the uh, words that we've heard today have spoken about uh, Mr. Lockerett's bill. And uh, it's my hope that this committee will make that in order because I believe it speaks to a lot of reservations that a number of people have around the table who might normally want to and wish to vote for the bill, but because of some of the activities of the Senate, they may not be able to do so. It's my hope that the Rules Committee will make Mr. Locke's Lockerett's bill in order. Uh, Mr. Frank and Mr. Baucus, I uh, just have one simple question, and that is, if you look at the stock market, it's pretty easy to tell by turning on the TV whether it's up or down. Is there an indicator that tells us by some value about the credit agencies and ratings, and what has that activity well, there were, historically, what has it turned into, and how can we look at that to gain? There, there are some indicators. For instance, there is the London Interbank Offering Rate, LIBOR, which is at historic highs right now. That's the amount that banks charge each other for loans. And of course, the amount the bank charges another bank, that's the starting point for what the bank Loans. We've got a lot of anecdotal evidence about credit being drying up. Um, and uh, if you look at, uh, as I said, the, the LIBOR rate, it's, uh, I think, at, at historic highs. So There's no one indicator like this age, but uh, the anecdotal evidence and such indicators as we have are that credit is really deteriorating. Yeah. It's even worse than the stock market. Those are overnight lending rates. Yeah. And, uh, so in other words, you would draw the conclusion if we were two years ago not in this emer uh, in this circumstance that we're in, you would say if it's very high that that's an indication of a credit problem. Yes. As opposed to low, which would be the rate. Right, because what happens is when a bank borrows from another bank and has to pay a high interest rate, that's the starting point for what it charges the, the business person or the consumer because they have to pay what they pay the other bank plus their, uh, their ability to make a profit. So there are indicators that are in the marketplace yeah. that reaffirm what we're talking about. Yes, sir. Okay. I yield back. Mr. Welch. I want to thank both of you. We've got a trouble. 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 We've got on the, on the table, and if uh, it gets rejected or it gets passed, at least there's a decision to get to move on. And uh, and I've got a lot of things I'd love to have in the bill, Barney. I'd love to have the bank with supervision because I think at a practical level, it's much more workable. But uh, you know, no one wanted that more than you. Would. Well, like John, John, you? Yes. If we open that up, I'll be happy to support that. Thing, would you? <laughs> well, let me say this. Let me talk about this. I, I have a lot of things that I was putting in the bill. I was putting nothing in this bill that would delay it. This is something that the body has said by a vast majority that they support. This is something that in all our discussions uh, with, the, with the Senate, uh, 
almost to the person, every senator in that room and every House member in that room said this was what ought to be done. Until said? Treasury, can I just say this? Until uh, Treasury said to the contrary, and then the Senate Republicans said no, and it's just indisputable that it would delay it for at least a week. The Senate's not going to pass this bill uh, if we do it right. on Friday, on Monday. Uh, that's the way let, the Senate let works. Let me propose this. Let send a delegation. Ask the House Democratic, I mean, the Senate. The Senate Democratic already told leadership. us this. Well, I would like them publicly to come out, every member of the leadership over there, and say whether or not this would kill the bill. Well, gee, if we send it, a delegation. It, it would take an hour for them to do that. If we're going to have a delegation, it's going to take us a day to get visas to go over I, there. I think Majority Leader uh, Reid and I think uh, uh, Senator McConnell right. ought to answer that question. Well, then I recommend that you ask them. I mean, I'm wondering, Mr. Bacchus, whether you could ask them. It's not an unreasonable question, but I think it's, it's not an unreasonable question, but I think it is asking why the Congress and the American people are Well, I, I don't understand the logic. If we all agree on this, why we say now, if we do something we all agree on, we're all going to pile because on the, and, and, and uh, uh, mire this thing out for another week or two. Let me respond. On one occasion, you say that you think this ought to go through tomorrow, as I do. I mean, I'm going to vote on it tomorrow. I'm going to find it, I found it incredibly hard on Monday to vote for this because it was not what I would have proposed. Uh, but at the same time, it addressed one of the problems with the economy. It didn't address other, but it did, it did address one. It's more risky than what I would have uh, proposed, which is covered bonds. My own leadership rejected that. Uh, but we're not there, but where we are is we, we could approve this amendment, we could pass this bill with a broader majority, and let me tell you, the, the American people will feel more confident with this, and we have, one of our main problems is, is consumer confidence, and I'm afraid with these pork barrel projects in here, and this $700 billion appropriated to a program that can only use 50 a month, with and and that, can, that they're going to lose confidence in them. I believe they're beginning to do that. In fact, I listen to financial shows, and I can tell you that Wall Street, which is not my concern. My concern is Main Street, but I, I exactly, I believe well, what Mr. I don't know, Welcher Cordoza said, that, that if anyone thinks Wall Street doesn't affect Main Street, uh, it'll be a bitter lesson for them in the next let me, year. Let me just so respond here. You and I are allies on saying something we, needs to be done. The fact is, that this is similar to what we heard on Monday, and people said, well, you know, we, if we defeat this bill again, or it doesn't come up, or we pass it, and I, the Senate holds it for a week, and by the way, the administration has said they will not accept it, and they'll be pushing hard, they're trying to get Senate to hold up, that will be the negative result. We can't do this quickly. Yeah, I mean, I, I've come to that conclusion. And it's frustrating because there's a lot of things everybody would like in the bill, but I, I, I think it's important to get it on the floor and have Congress vote and uh, show that we're on the job. But thank you. Uh, 75 people have voted, uh, so we've got a good uh, five, six, seven minutes. We'll keep you posted on that. Ms. Uh, Castro? Present, uh, the amendments or statements in time for the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, gentlemen, thank you both for having us. Mr. Chairman, are you comfortable with the three provisions you put in there that warrants and the fact that we're holding the paper and the recapture that we're going to get and the taxpayers are going to get? Yes, uh, that's probably the best part of the bill. Remember, when the bill came up, there was uh, no intention to buy equity. And uh, we insisted that equity be a piece of this and that uh, you get not just the normal return you would get from being a preferred shareholder, but a warrant so that in addition, if there was profitability, we share on that. We also won very big fight with the administration. This was Senator Jack Reed took the lead on this and we were supportive. Uh, the secretary refu refused initially to agree that there should be warrants in the cases of auctions. He said, if you do that, then people won't get into the auction. So we came up with what we thought was a pretty good idea, which is to say, all right, we won't have a precondition that you put a warrant on if you're going to take an auction. But if you sell things to us in an auction and you hit a certain minimum, not a very high minimum, then you'll have to give us, you'll have to give us warrants. So, yeah, on, on the part of... Your 
On the part about the warrants and, and the equity, I think we have done the maximum to, uh, uh, to minimize the taxpayer exposure. Uh, Mr. Bacchus, how about you, sir? I'm, I'm not completely comfortable uh, because it, the operative word is, is discretion in the secretary uh, when it could have said, uh, but I will say this, it's much better than it was. And I believe it, it offers, what is in there offers uh, uh, a tremendous amount of protection that the taxpayer will recoup, uh, will recoup value if, uh, if the corporations remain solid. You know, we all have anecdotal stories of uh, you know, our associates. Uh, but I will say this, well, there are things I'm not confident about this program. And, and I will not be until it, it is up and operating and I see uh, the first 50 or, or 100 billion spent and then we'll all know 100% more about the program than we do now and, and whether, uh, how those guarantees are going to function. Well, and, and my point is this, that if we're reasonably comfortable that the taxpayers are protected and they're going to be paid back, I'm afraid that it would be irresponsible for us not to act, not to act quickly. And, and I'm not, I'm not believe you me, I, I'm not urging that this body not act. Let me just add to Mr. Curry that in addition to the warrants, and the, it's not discretionary on the Secretary to get the warrants. He obviously can set the level, but the, the amount of the warrant, as the Chairwoman said, every single transaction that this is, that's done under here is immediately made public, it's put on the internet, and it's reported to the Oversight Board. So if there is a, uh, an insufficiency in the warrants, we'll know that pretty quickly. And I just think that, that I would, I agree with you. I mean, it was, this will be much harder for me to vote yes for than it was on Monday with, with, with the things that the Senate put in. But I'm just very concerned that if we don't act on it and things move as quick, anywhere near as quickly as they moved on Monday, um, that the industry is going to be affected. And, you know, I've heard the anecdotal stories. I'm sure everyone has in their own district. So I thank you both, Madam Chair. I yield back. Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to be very quick, um, but I do want to just talk a little bit about what the Senate added. We've heard a lot of uh, sort of disparagement about what has come back. I have to say that I agree, at least in part, with Mr. diaz Villard that the, certainly the increase in the FDIC um, amounts to be insured is, is a, an improvement. And I just want to clarify, um, Representative Bacchus, if I could, with you, because I think that you uh, did not refer to that as pork barrel spending, and I think you also agreed with um, Mr. Uh, Hastings of Florida that the AMT patch, which will prevent so many people with getting whacked by the AMT uh, tax in the middle class next year, is not pork barrel spending, right? I, I, you agree with that? I agree. Okay, and I, if I could just clarify some of the other things, because I think that they are um, actually improvements aimed at helping the middle class that came back from the Senate. And I want to make sure that the public is clear about whether or not you think those are pork barrel spending or if you think that those are not. Um, the Midwest Disaster Tax Relief, do you consider that pork barrel spending? The what? The Midwest Disaster Tax Relief that's in the bill. Let me say this. I think, you know, that we, we've all heard the famous expression is you, you, when you see it, you know it. And uh, uh, I'm not, I, there are, we identified what I thought were the egregious ones. It's in the amendment, and I sort of, Mr. Lasserette, can re, he can go over every one of those, and he can answer the question as to whether or not it's in or in. Or you can answer it. Is that, is that? You know what, I can ask it another no. way. It's not in. Okay. So well, whether I can or ask not, it another if, way. Whether or not. And I, I don't know enough about it to answer. As I, as I understand, Mr. Mr. Latourette from Ohio is not opposed to Midwestern relief. I, 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 I gather. I gather. Okay. And, and if I could, um, Madam Chair, just very quickly, because I think it's important, because we keep hearing pork barrel spending, and we are all opposed to those things that are sort of outlandish that are in the bill. Right. But there are many other things, and I'd just like to make sure that the American sure. people know that they're in there because they're aimed directly at helping people who are not on Wall Street, but yes. who are on Main Street. Yes. Um, the AMT patch, the child tax credit, mental health parity, which we heard mentioned here today, qualified tuition deduction, small business R&D tax credit, renewable energy production tax credits, renewable energy investment tax credits, clean renewable energy bonds, hybrid vehicle tax credits, energy conservation and efficiency incentives, carbon mitigation incentives, um, also, of course, the Secure Rural Schools uh, Initiative. The, these things, now we all 
we all share a consternation mm -hmm. that uh, some of them came back not paid for when the House, yeah. of course, was willing to pay for uh, almost all of those things, and we have, have passed bills to that effect. But you would agree that those things that I just listed that were added by the Senate are not pork barrel spending. Uh, I, I would agree that they should have been paid for. Uh, I would agree the things that you listed, I think primarily to the best of my ability, were not. And, and uh, Mr. Lasserette, when he tells you the ones that are in this amendment, those. you're going you're gonna to hold your nose if you vote for. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I'm offended by those as well, but I think it's important that we also note these other things that are not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But some of them are still paid for, the things that I mentioned. So listen, I, I, I want to compliment this body yeah. and the Senate for making significant improvements to the entire bill. And okay. I'm not challenging that. What I'm saying is that, that uh, uh, to approve the full seven hundred billion dollars when we don't know how you know uh, when we have an opportunity to see it work and it's a month from now or two months from now and uh, see if if we agree with with how it's working you know there's been uh, economists at several leading uh, schools that have said I don't think this will work or I don't think that'll work I'd like to have the answers to those questions uh, they say they could be winners or losers. What if this or what if that? I'd like to see in that first $150 billion, we'll know in two days, uh, we'll have all those opportunities. We will be able to review that first $100 billion and make an informed decision. And I think that's what the American people want us to do. We're not holding anything up with this amendment. What we're doing is we're stripping some egregious insults to the American people. And some ways they say, well, gosh, it's only a billion or only a half a billion. It, it, is, it undermines the confidence of the American people in, in our body if we say that we had no choice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bacchus. Uh, we all have to go vote. We excuse you now. Uh, we're going to recess for this vote and the two that follow. They're five-minute votes, and it will be very difficult to come and get back up here. Appreciate all of you waiting. We'll be back. Uh, and the Democrat, yes, as soon as you vote the last vote and do it in a hurry, come back up. The Democrat caucus does start right after these votes, but I, I expect everybody to come back here. Thank you. Please come to order. Uh, let me call forward Mr. LaTourette and Mr. Latham. Um, thank you for your patience. Oh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chairman, um, we may be joined by a couple of other uh, co-sponsors of the amendment, Mr. Dent and Mr. Gerlach. I know we're here. All right. <laughs> when... uh, he's also a co-sponsor, but I don't believe he'll be back. Um, and so I, I would ask you to sort of consider their uh, ability to sit with us and share a thought or two, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. The, the amendment uh, is, is simple. Uh, the amendment simply indicates that the $700 billion figure is reduced to $250 billion. And I, I have some comments about the testimony of the chairman, the ranking member, and the questions that were asked that I'll get to in a minute. But for me, as a 14-year member of Congress, the most significant change that the amendment makes to the bill is that it turns the negative vote into a positive vote. And so as, a, as somebody that's being asked to pass on $700 billion and, and the proposal in the Senate bill is 250 plus 100, so still even under the bill that's before us, $350 billion, the way that the bill is crafted is that the, Senate, the House would have to disapprove the spending of that money. And let's say that we took a vote and 250 of us disapproved giving that additional money and the President vetoed that disapproval. 
It then would require 290 of us to override the President's veto and 67 senators. To me, uh, that's not a comfortable position. The last thing it does, and I heard a lot of questions, I, I intentionally, as a Republican, I could have gone after the renewable tax credits and the green stuff that some Republicans do. Well, I didn't do that. I picked the most egregious, $192 million for rum. Uh, we did the wooden arrows for children, the $15 million for the film industry, and there's one more that's missing my mind, but it's, it's in... That was mine. That was yours. Well, I, I didn't target you. I'm trying to save Hickey Freeman, which is the last suit maker for men in the United States, and they've had this uh, tax uh, yep. for, um, for about well, 10, Madam, 15 years. Well, Madam Chairman, I, I hope that doesn't doom my amendment to, to uh, failure in front of your august committee, but I will tell you, I didn't, I didn't know Freeman that. Hickey Freeman means a great deal to us. I, I'm sure he does, and he's an enchanting character. But I, I, I think that uh, my point on those, whereas... As a Republican, I'm glad the tax extenders are in there. I'm glad the FDIC thing is in there. I'm glad that the SEC finally got off their butt and made some adjustments, and then they really haven't done what we need to have them do on mark to market. They need to do more, and I understand FASB is going to come out with some stuff next week that maybe gets us from there. But the point of the amendment is, and Mr. Bacchus, I think, pretty accurately laid it out, is that I, I don't have a lot of trust. And, and when I hear things like, uh, oh, we can't do it because the Senate won't let us, or we can't do it because the administration won't let us. Madam Chairman, with all due respect, I would suggest to you that the reason that there are nine Democrats currently on the Rules Committee and only four Republicans is because we said that about George Bush's administration on a pretty regular basis. And let me, let me tell you where we got here and why we have no confidence in the number. And I'd ask unanimous consent to introduce into the record a, an article from Forbes magazine uh, dated September the 23rd. Is that objection? Thank you. And the critical point that, that I've... Uh, highlighted is when the Treasury spokesperson was asked how they came up with $700 billion, her quote is, it's not based on any particular data point, we just wanted to choose a really large number. Now, any member of Congress that's instilled with confidence that $700 billion is the right number based upon that observation, I, I feel a little, a little uneasy and a little, and a little squeamish. The, the second thing, I know that the second unanimous consent would be to introduce a, a document again uh, dated September the 24th um, that's uh, from the Atlantic.com uh, and the key is Se Se Secretary Paulson told Congress yesterday that the plan was to spend roughly 50 billion a month so under under this amendment we can come back on November the 17th uh, he should still have about 200 billion dollars left laying around that we authorize this I didn't pick $50 billion. I didn't pick $100 billion. I picked 250 billion because I know that's the discussions that were going on by your side, by my side, by a lot of people that were talking about it. And if $250 billion doesn't send a signal to the street, well, shame on them. That's, that's a lot of money from a lot of people. Uh, and then it says, well, guess what? We come back on November 17th, as we're all coming back on November 17th, and we'll vote it again, and we have to approve it. Now, I also heard that if we reopen the bill, and Mr. McGovern, I want to address you specifically, I agree with you. I would have put up a whole lot of stuff in this bill if I could have, as would you. But this gives you the opportunity, you, the Democratic Party, the opportunity, at another bite of the apple on November the 17th, to argue for cram down, to argue for ACORN, to argue for enhanced foreclosure protection. You get another shot. But, but to surrender our authority and say we can't do it because the Senate sent it over here with a bunch of pork and are trying to jam it down our throats, what they've done to us is nothing different than Secretary Paulson did when he came up here with a two and a half page bill and tried to jam it down our throats. I, here's what I'm asking you. Uh, I know that this is the Speaker's Committee. I know that you can do whatever you want in terms of making things in order. I'm asking you to permit the 435 members of Congress 10 minutes tomorrow to talk on this amendment. And before you vote your rule, I would ask, I know your caucus is meeting now, go ask them. Go ask the, the guys from the Midwest and the South and the Northwest how they feel about it. We're meeting at 9 o'clock tomorrow. We should ask our conference how they feel about it. And then after you've collected all that input, I'm sure you're going to come up with a great rule. But I ask you to think about it. I, I think this is important, and I thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Lockhart. Mr. Latham? I, I thank the chairwoman and uh, all the members of the committee. To, to me, this is all about accountability. And just to give the Treasury Secretary a blank check for $700 billion is simply wrong. We have an opportunity with this amendment 
to limit how much money is available. And then if we believe uh, in a month, whenever we come back here, that uh, he has done a good job and that it is deserved and that this is working, then we go ahead then and give additional funds. Uh, but just to give the Treasury Secretary a blank check, because they picked the number out of the sky as $700 billion. And, and Madam Chairman, this, this is what makes my constituents irate, is the fact that we are turning over our authority here in Congress over to the Treasury Secretary, one person with $700 billion in her pocket. And to me, this is just wrong. Now, there, the Senate uh, improvements uh, as far as the extenders bill is very important for a place like Iowa because there's the uh, flood disaster relief tax uh, initiatives that are in that that are very, very important for families, for small businesses, for the state to recover. Uh, and, is that pork? No, it is not. And also, are you, you know, distinguishing? I'm, I'm, uh, never mind. Well, I, I don't think, you know, the, all the help that we gave to. Uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama after Katrina and Rita. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's pork. We're still appropriating money for those. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact of the matter is that it it's, makes it very, very difficult because uh, my constituents look at the $700 billion, and we have had to wait three and a half months to finally get money to address the floods in the Midwest, in Iowa and throughout the Midwest. That the, the we're not allowed to vote before we went home in August to uh, appropriate funds for that, but just the second that this Treasury Secretary comes up to Congress and says, "I on a two and a half page uh, bill saying I want seven hundred billion dollars and don't ask any questions," it is just outrageous to my constituents, and uh, I just think that what Mr. La Tourette has come up with is a very good compromise solution to this situation we're in. And I think if there's any question about passing the overall, uh, uh, call it bailout bill, whatever, that this is the way to do it. You would get a huge vote in the House of Representatives if, in fact, this amendment were uh, allowed on the floor of the House. Well, I, uh, I was in all the meetings when we worked on this bill, the leadership, um, $750 billion is not really given to the Treasury. We put, as I pointed out a while ago, a GAO office in the Treasury. Every move he makes is going to be on the Internet and has to be reported. So they don't have what I'd call a blank check. But it was the Democrats' idea to give him $250 billion to start with. Uh, and 40 Republican senators in the Senate refused to vote for this bill with that in it. Have you talked to them? Have you talked to people on your side to ask them why they killed it, because th that was in, our, in the bill we lost on Monday. I mean, that was always our idea here. I, I, Madam Chairman, let, let me make two observations. As a Republican in an election year in a swing district, being on the other side of the Bush administration and the Republicans in the Senate does not displease me. Uh, but yes, yesterday, I will tell you, I, I didn't spring this on anybody. I've had conversations with a lot of people in your party, including those very know, close to the speaker, yes. and we sent a delegation. We didn't send them over like Mr. Bacchus suggested through a senator from Texas to discuss this with Mr. McConnell and Mr. Reed and Mr. Schumer, uh, and they said we're too far along the process to even think about it. And I, I think from my observation, I, I think you all had a great idea. $250 billion is it? And it was if a great, it's a great idea. idea then, it's still a great idea. And if we could have passed that on Monday, mm -hmm. I think the Senate would have taken it. Absolutely. But I think their trains left the station. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty concerned that... Uh, sure. And, and, uh, and Madam Chairman, I, I, I don't disagree with you that the change is chugging down the track, but I, but I have to say that I think that, in my humble opinion, and I'm not a rich guy, what set the market into a tailspin was having a vote that lost. And, and we're in the vote-counting business in this mm -hmm. place, and anybody that took that bill to the floor without having a uh, pass, knowing that you were going to supply well, a certain number of votes and we were going to supply a certain number of votes, shame on us. That sent the wrong signal. That's right. Uh, it wouldn't have sent any signal if we would waited a couple of days. We were responsible for 120, delivered 141. Well, uh, Madam Chairman, I'm not going to I'm not going to quibble with you, but uh, That's the my truth. my leadership says that I'm going to tell you my leadership says no deal was cut that way. And secondly, my leadership also says that at noon on that day we walked down the hallway and said we had 65, whether well, there was a deal or not. And I heard that after the caucus on Sunday that right. you had about 60 votes, but I think we're waiting now from the White House to get a list of 100 yeah. uh, to see where we're going to go with this. Well, and I, I'm going to tell you, you can have 180 if you make sure. this amendment in order. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I voted, we voted that Monday. Um, does anybody else have questions in this panel? Mr. Tasty? I do. Thank you, uh, Mr. I, <clears throat> earlier on, when Mr. Boschus and Mr. Frank were up here, I talked that we are a process committee, and you both have talked uh, eloquently about, about what's in your minute. But you're not asking the Rules Committee to develop a rule that says your amendment must pass. Oh, absolutely not. You are simply saying, give us an opportunity to debate it on both sides. Right. I, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking the Rules Committee to make an order this amendment for as long or as short as you want so that the 420 members that didn't have the opportunity to be in the room during these negotiations can say whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. The only argument that I've heard, while well, Mr. the Chairman and the Ranking Member here, that, that I think is, is, well, there have been a lot of valid ones, but I think the thought that this would slow it down by a week, I, I, I think that that's a real concern. Everybody gets to that this is a problem. But you know what? I'm also comfortable with saying, you know what, United States Senate, you larded this bill up with pork when it's trying to help and bail out the economy. Why don't you do it tomorrow? Why don't you do it Saturday? Why don't you do it Sunday? And, and you know what? I, I think that if everybody that call has been calling me and you called their senators, they'd do it tomorrow. They'd do it Saturday. And, and this thing would pass 90 to 9 over in the Senate, and it would pass 435. Years. Did you find out why it didn't pass the Senate? Yeah. Excuse me, but I, I really need to have to... I have, have, to, I have to yield to you. Thank you. I need to follow that up. Yes, what, what did you find out from your Republican senators that wouldn't have it? Uh, what I found out was, when I, I didn't approach them early, I approached them last night hoping we could not have the argument that we're having here today about delaying things. I wanted the Senate to put it into their package last night, and I was told they're not interested. Not interested. Not interested. Let me okay. just make another... But you think they would be interested if we do it here? Yes. Oh, I, I, Is that what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. I, I, I have to tell you... Do you have some reason to believe that? Well, Madam Chairman, I, gotta t I saw the vote last night, and, and do you think that the, some of the Democratic senators that voted for the package didn't do it with holding their nose and wouldn't welcome the opportunity to quickly reduce this amount to $250 billion. They did it because well, they felt there was a sense of urgency and there was no other choice. There were choice. 25 no votes. Right. And, uh, but, and they, have, they were not interested. Right. Well, anyway, I don't want to belabor this point. We've got to get got going. It. Mr. Hastings, thank you I, for yielding. I, I just want to say this. Mr. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Frank uh, uh, mentioned this in his opening remarks. Mm -hmm. Uh, about saying that this has been vetted by a lot of people. I mean, this issue has been in the forefront. All of us have probably looked at this in, at this bill uh, in detail as much as we possibly can. But the fact of the matter is, and again, the process gets kind of boring, but the only two times, there's been only two times that the Congress has had a hearing on this bill, at least the House. Right. First one was at 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. Sunday night in the rules room. Here. And the other one is tonight. Right. And, and I, I, I just, well, I, I point that out because uh, I, I think that while process is important, sometimes you have to fast track, but this yeah. has been going on for two weeks now. Well, Mr. Hastings, I, I would just add to that, aside from what you've indicated, I happen to sit on the Financial Services Committee, which has jurisdiction over the vast majority of this bill. I have not had the opportunity to vote on this bill in committee or any amendment, trying to perfect it, Republican or Democrat. I also was present on Monday and voted no. I have not had the opportunity to vote on any amendment to the package that was presented to me on Monday. I didn't have the chance as a member of the minority to vote on a motion to recommit to improve the bill from the minority's perspective. So, and again, if you approve a rule with no amendments, and, and any amendments, you will again be saying to all the members of the House that, that you all, you, you 13 people, are going to determine what, if we can even have 10 minutes to talk about something this important. I, I hope you, I hope we'll join you. I thank my friend for yielding. And let me just say that uh, since Mr. Hastings has just outlined it uh, very well, that the uh, only hearing uh, that has taken place has been on two occasions on this legislation here in the Rules Committee, I can assure you that there uh, will be a vote. Uh, I intend to offer your amendment to the rule in uh, hopes that we might be able to uh, make it in order. And so the uh, I'm not terribly uh, optimistic about the prospect of that, as Mr. Latham and I have discussed. But uh, it'll be interesting that as we've proceeded with the amendment process on uh, this measure, the, uh, the only chance will be for those of us who are uh, in this committee to uh, cast that vote based on what most likely would happen. <laughs> and I just want to, uh, I just want to conclude because those of us sitting on this committee, uh, we, we talk about process more than policy because that's what our, our jobs are. But I, I, I would hope, because if, if this comes out as a closed rule, it will once again set the record for the most closed rules in the Congress. Now, I, 
I know that there's frustration on our side. When the, the German yields, I, I will in a moment. I, I would hope that uh, members of the uh, of the other side would would kind of take a, a step back and say, "Wow, you know, a process, a process that doesn't allow 435 members to have a say going through uh, going through whatever uh, the legislation is." It is not a process that I think is really representative as the founders envisioned the people's house. And uh, I go ahead. Happy well, I, I, I just you know, totally concur with you. I, all we're asking for is to give the 435 members of this house a chance to vote on this. This is not guaranteeing any outcome, but I, I can assure you, I, in my mind, this is going to be an overwhelming vote. And to not allow a vote simply uh, on something as important as something as huge as this issue is uh, and means so much to the people back at home, I, th I think uh, uh, is very, very troubling. And Mr. Shannick says to Rabney, I'd just like to make a quick comment with the intelligence of the chair. I'll be extremely brief. I simply want to say that I think the entire nation is watching this vote, and they're watching the manner in which it's handled. And I want to commend Mr. La Tourette. I think it is important that the people understand that this process is open and fair and balanced. I think Mr. Lockhart's amendment does that, and I would urge the committee to give it very, very thoughtful consideration. I'll yield it, my friend. Uh, I'll, I'll ask my own time. That's, uh, well, that's fine. Uh, Mr. McGarvey. I, 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 I appreciate uh, your sentiments, and, uh, and I think that uh, uh, it, it ought to be. I'll certainly support the, uh, the motion by the ranking member to make this in order. Just so we can simply have a debate on it. So appreciate it. I yield back. Mr. McGovern. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just, uh, just a couple of points. Um, uh, so, so, you know, I know the C-SPAN cameras are here, and so we're, we, we have sometimes we, we give speeches that uh, play to the audience and, uh, and kind of ignore reality. But the fact of the matter is we are here uh, because the President of the United States told us there was an emergency. The Secretary of Treasury came up here uh, almost a couple of weeks ago and said that we needed to act immediately. I mean, that is why we are here. That is why we have, you know, kind of had ex an expedited process to move this thing quickly to the floor. To the best of my knowledge, uh, the discussions, and I don't think Mr. Bacchus would disagree, have been bipartisan um, all the way through this process. There are lots of things, um, as a Democrat who would like stronger provisions on foreclosures and bankruptcy and things that I care very deeply about that I would have loved to have seen in this bill, that I would love to amend, uh, but, you know, I mean, I'm respecting the fact that we were told that there's an emergency here. So this notion that somehow the majority um, is just kind of playing fast and loose with the rules on this issue, um, I, I don't think is, is a fair characterization, number one. But Chairman um, Yield, yeah, I mean, thank you for including, and I really, really appreciate his underscoring this with such uh, <laughs> emphasis. I did that for you. Yes, no, no. I, I just wanted to express my appreciation for underscoring the fact that so, so I mean, I, I, this issue. Right, but I do think it is important to put this in perspective. Secondly, with regard to the issue of a delay, I mean, and we, you know, we can argue, we can quibble over whether or not that that's a big deal or not. I do think it is a big deal. I mean, I was home uh, these last few days, and. Uh, my small businesses One are calling day. me and telling me that, in fact, they are, you know, that they're having more difficulty accessing credit. People are getting nervous. My, the governor of my state, the governor of California, is weighing on this. There, this is a serious issue. The notion that we, uh, you know, and that we're building up a vote. Uh, the Senate passed. We, uh, the Senate passed their uh, bill last night, and now we're expected to pass our vote tomorrow. And then we're going to do nothing and walk away or delay this for a week, I will tell you, I think that will have a very devastating impact um, on the credit markets. Finally, Mr. Lay, just, I, want to, I just want to be clear for those who are watching. We are not, um, so people are clear, that we are not here debating the three-page bill that the President and Secretary Paulson sent up here. No, and, absolutely. In fact, this is a very different bill. Um, and um, and w whether people like it or not, uh, and I'm not here to defend the bill in entirety. There's lots that I don't like about the bill. But it is not the same bill. This is not simply a three-page bill, $700 billion. Thank you. See you. But I thought it's important to make those points um, because, I, you know, this is, no, this is not a game. And I think if we don't do the right thing or if we walk away tomorrow without doing anything or, you know, or, 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 or defeating another bill, um, I think we'll have a, a – I think this bad crisis is going to get much, much worse. And I don't want to go that way. 
What, can I make yeah, a comment? Yes, sure. Yeah, sure. Let, 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 me, let me just say this. No, nobody's advocating walking away and not doing anything. Everybody that's talked to, has said we got to do something. I agree with you. We're, we're, we're wrangling over whether or not we take your idea of $250 billion that you advocated for, but the White House said no and the Senate said no, and make that the law of the land. Gives him more money, the Treasury, more money than they say they can burn between now and January. We're going to come back. We're going to have a new president-elect. You guys think you're picking up 20 seats. You're going to get six senators. You can do cram down. You can do acorn. You can do all of the stuff that, that you would put in this bill if you wanted to. Oh, but I, I, I can only... I want to start a bankruptcy position. You, yeah, put that in there, too. But, but I'm saying, I, I can only speak for myself. As a, somebody that represents 600,000 people, I am not willing to abdicate my vote to the United States Senate because they said no, or to the President of the United States. Well, I, I would just simply say with respect that we had our opportunity to do something on Monday, and unfortunately we didn't do it. And I think going to the point of the Chairwoman of the Committee, Thanks. Um, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, it does, I think, you know, you, it, it should matter whether or not we have an agreement that we could move something if we were to change our approach here. I think that is important. You know, we shouldn't be doing something and saying, well, let's, let, let's play a game of chicken. This is serious. You know, people people are in trouble. This country is in trouble. And look, I appreciate what you're saying. I'm just raising raising those points because I, I, I just wanted to clarify for them. But, well, that, that, listen, I'm but, I'm, I'm all with. One of the, and I just want is the is, you don't consider the Western Schools Program pork, do you? Well, you, you can ask me about the whole list. There are four identified. No, I just want to make sure of that. No, no, no. Well, you know, listen. You, I mean, I've heard these questions. I can tell you what the amendment's pretty clear. I identified four. I'll take out Kinky Friedman if it gets me the chairman's it's, vote. It wasn't in there. Okay, but uh, it's four. And so you can ask me about flood insurance. You can uh, ask me about anything you want. It's four. They're listed there. You can all read them. I yield to the gentleman. Um, I'd just like to make a point. Um, it's my understanding that when the stock market dropped nearly um, 800 points the other day, we lost 1.2 trillion in this economy. I just got on my BlackBerry. I did some reports uh, on some Wall Street Journal type type publications, and there's uh, someone here that's talking about that if we don't pass this bill soon, the Dow could be at 7,000. I don't know what that calculates in trillions, but I know that just the tax revenue on that kind of, the loss of tax revenue would be much greater than even the, the amounts that we're talking about. So I think we have to be very careful about how we proceed, how diligently we proceed on this um, putting out the fire in the economy. Mr. Pedroza, can, can I add one thing that I don't yes. think has been said? We, we are relying on Treasury and what they say. And one of the things they have said to us this week is they have started hiring people for this program. And it will take them two to three weeks to get this program in place. They, they do not need the legislation to do that. They are already hiring it. They are already constructing it. So we do not delay this program one hour. And while there may be some perception that it does, the market is sophisticated enough to know that. Right. So I want to say that we are not delaying this program. This, if we pass this bill tonight, it would be two to three weeks before. And it would be the same time had we passed it Monday, today, tomorrow, or next Tuesday. It's, it, it was 14 to 21 days since they started putting this in place. I, I thank the gentleman. I think the psychological, psychological impact on the market. And what it will do, real. it will take these pork barrel projects tax. out and save the taxpayers. But we're, we're still hundreds we're, of millions of we're dollars. We're still faced with the question whether or not the Senate would take anything. And again, my final point: the only reason why I kind of went off on this tirade is because I thought that there was a consensus um, after the bill was defeated on Monday that we would try to proceed in a, in, a, in a bipartisan way. And I, I get the feeling that some of the comments on this committee were getting a little bit more partisan than I think. And let me say this, to be. Jim, I couldn't oh, agree no, with I'm you more. You. Hey, listen, I wish people would quit that. I wish they would quit talking about Republicans or Democrats and let's get through this together. All right, thank I you. totally hey, agree with you. And, and if I may, Akami, you talked about the Senate. Apparently they're staying in this weekend just in case there are differences between the bills. For that very reason, and so the the idea that somehow this is going to be delayed uh, by an amendment that I think is very well written and very thoughtful, and actually gives you know, credibility to this whole process, uh, the Senate can act this weekend. We can have it done by uh, tomorrow night or Saturday. 
uh, because the Senate is here just in case there is a change like this. Mr. the gentleman I really do believe that my um, our colleagues, uh, all of whom that I've served with and all of whom I have great respect for, uh, ignore uh, the realities with reference to how the U.S. Senate operates. And if by chance, not only this, and there are a substantial number of members, some here on both sides of the aisle and elsewhere in our, our, our group in the House of Representatives, that have rather uh, important and substantial measures that they would like to offer, or uh, that um, pretty obviously, um, if any one of them are made in order, in my judgment, it would mean uh, that it would go to the Senate. Now you say that that's okay, that the Senate can act, and you're right. But will the Senate act? Now let's, let's go back to where the chair lady was. 25 senators voted no. All of us are experienced people in this process. I don't know how many Democrats or how many Republicans, but I do know that there were Democrats and Republicans that voted no. Mm -hmm. I have a belief without knowing that some of them were thinking about the fact um, uh, that items were included in the package that they passed that did not include what they wanted in the package. So now send it back over there and open, up, open it up to that arcane process. And I can assure you we may wind up doing nothing. And if we don't do something, and if we don't do it soon, we're going to push our economy into no man's land or where the potential uh, for abject financial instability is very real. It's not only the Wall Street executives who are going to suffer in the event of a crash. It is the average American citizen in each of our respective constituencies, uh, like those uh, that live in any of the places that we represent. The cost of this package obviously are high, uh, but the cost of allowing our financial markets to fail would be catastrophic. And we all know that. And so you're talking goodbye to student loans, see your mortgages, so long auto loans, and this is what we're looking at if we don't act, not what the Senate uh, may do or can do. And I don't have any belief uh, that the Senate will take any measure and open it up, and when we see it again, that it isn't something else that we are going to have to act on. And I think that that would be uh, abhorrent for us to do. May I make an observation on your comment, Mr. Hastings? Yeah. Sure. Uh, let, let, let me just uh, say this, okay. and, and that is that if, we, if you were to make this amendment in order and we saved the taxpayers $450 billion and it went back to the Senate and the Senate larded it up with more park, pork, as, I know he's not a big popular guy on your side, but as John McCain says, you will know their name and, and shame on them, first of all. And, and as you keep reminding us, $450 billion is about four years in Iraq. So uh, to make the bill better and not abdicate our responsibility, it's, why, why can't they have some heat? And, and I'm not an expert on Senate rules. My observation of 14 years, they don't appear to have any rules. But, but I think they could deem this thing. We could pass it, they could deem it. Not one of them has to get off the beach. They could stay there and deem the thing. So I don't think, I, if they want to, they could do it. Just well, make the record for yourself, uh -oh. you meant the rock where you said the rock. Sorry, would would gentlemen yield? The Senate has just announced they're going into pro forma session now until November 17th. The Senate has announced that they will be in pro forma session from now to the 17th of November. Oh. That means they're not here. <laughs> well, that, that, that means they yeah, that, that, that means they might come back and they pick a date that they could all come back so we could still be. Chairman, Chairman. I would think, you know, to suggest they would not come back. That, we understand oh, no, no, you that. Didn't they they do might that. come back, but we again, know we're they, talking about timing. They, they, and we're talking about no guarantee whatever that they would accept this amendment, which we understand they weren't interested in, we, 40 of them. So it's an awful big gamble to take with people's lives. We should not reward their bad behavior on, well, on this issue. 
We should but, not reward those four or five senators who slip this into the bill. Uh, and we don't have to. Going to, do to and let me country. tell you, they will come back because the American people will tell them to be back, and okay. they'll be back in, within 12 hours. I can guarantee you. They're not leaving town. And if they do, the American people will demand that they come back. Are there any other questions? Yeah, you'll back my time. Any other? No. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, sure. gentlemen. Oh, you do have a question, Mr. Gaspar. Well, I, I just wanted to, uh, as I said, uh, and thank you, Madam Chair, for Certainly. Uh, uh, again, as I stated before, uh, uh, reiterate my uh, uh, my gratitude to Mr. Lauderette, who has uh, uh, worked uh, uh, very uh, intensely on, on this proposal. And I, uh, and, and all of you, for coming and, and sharing your thoughts. Uh, thank you as well. Uh, I will be uh, supporting the motion made by Mr. Dreyer to allow uh, our colleagues on the floor, all of them, all of them, uh, to uh, uh, to express their point of view uh, and vote on this amendment. Thank you. Can, can I just say one thing, yes. Mr. Diaz Ballard? And I, I, I don't know you have other witnesses listening, to this, so this will be very quick. I, I I would just ask this committee. I know you all are meeting down in HC5. We're meeting tomorrow at nine o'clock. If you go to your caucus, we go to our conference, and this proposal doesn't get 80% of your caucus and conference, and we say, you know what, 80% of the United States Congress wants to do this, then, then rule me out of order. But I, I beg you to please talk to your colleagues tonight, and, and don't come out with a rule real fast. I don't think we're going to be able to do that tonight. There you go. We don't expect to make it. Okay, 66. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you very much. Very much, Mr. DeFazio and Ms. Jackson Lee. Now, we did want to sort of request everybody, this is the same amendment you had last week. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would sort of abbreviate it, we would appreciate it because we think we understand right. it Right. Well. My amendment is not an amendment which has been previously submitted, but I okay. can explain it very simply. Thank uh, you. The amendment I've submitted says two things. I've just come from a meeting with uh, William Isaacs, who headed up the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Uh, and worked us out of the savings and loan crisis. He said there are vast emergency powers the FDIC has it hasn't used. They could, uh, at a recommendation of the Secretary of the Treasury and the President, with the approval of the FDIC board and the, uh, the Fed board, declare an emergency which gives them extraordinary powers. And his simple recommendation is that they would extend the same guarantee to every depository institution in America that they gave to Wachovia last week. That is, all general creditors are guaranteed. He said immediately this would create liquidity among the banks because the uncertainty goes away and foreign deposits would flood here because we become a safe repository. Now, it sounds too simple, too easy, uh, and of course it doesn't cost $700 billion. He thinks this would work. He has experience in regulated banks uh, you know, Mr. Paulson does not. Mr. Paulson's first move when he guaranteed money markets was to take $12 billion from banks and move it over to money markets because they had better insurance and higher rates of return. So it doesn't seem like he has a tremendous grasp of the problem he says he's trying to solve. So this would say first, he would, they would have to use all their emergency powers. And if that doesn't work, all he has to do is write us a letter and say, I tried that wasn't enough, and then all the rest of this bill would go into play, which with all its objectionable provisions. But it would go into play, he gets the $700 billion to play with as he wants. Now, so I think that's pretty simple. Say, use all your emergency powers, try these things. If that doesn't work, tomorrow, 10 minutes after we pass the bill, you can say, that didn't work. It, there's no limit on it. It just says, try these things. Then the second part is, if you use this bill, and if you borrow $700 billion, then on a retrospace, Retro, retrospective basis, retrospective basis, thank you, uh, Al, uh, annually, uh, you would uh, certify the cost and you would assess an appropriate fee to recoup that cost on an annual basis. That's the gist of the amendment, and it's, it's uh, a little different than what I proposed previously. Thank Very you, Very thoughtful as always, Mr. DeFazio. Are there any questions, Mr. DeFazio, Mr. Sessions? Uh, uh, and, uh, I think what the gentleman uh, is bringing forth as a, an idea and a good idea, mm -hmm. I voted for the bill, and I'm looking for more people to vote for, too, because I'd like for it to pass. 
I'd like for us to get on with our lives and with uh, solving the problem. But I also think that what the gentleman spoke about was uh, in the Wall Street Journal, maybe the 24th of September, I believe. And in fact, if there is deemed a risk to the entire financial system, the president can trigger this. And I thought that's what they told us was at hand. I think they've already used the words. Uh, and. And this is why, uh, Madam Chairman, I think that the gentleman from Mr. Fazio's amendment would be great. I think that Mr. Lachoret's uh, amendment should be made in order, uh, notwithstanding majorities or minorities back and forth. We've always argued one way or the other, either for or against the Senate based upon how we, whichever seat we sat in. I think this body should pass the darn bill and perhaps uh, the gentlewoman has already got a crystal ball that is going to pass. I am really not there yet. The only reason I'm not there yet is because uh, I, I went home for 48 hours, took the calls, some of the calls myself, and every single one of our members has been through an experience at home and heard from people, and I'm not sure it's going to be easier, even with the sweeteners, if that's what they're called. I believe that the members should be allowed, more than ever, the opportunity to bring good ideas, like Peter's, and you can certainly stage it in a way you can make it king of the hill if you want. Put his up, and maybe that answers the question. But we ought to have a chance to vote because we need to pass the bill that this Congress agrees to and not walk out of here where we're tails are between our legs and we see the market do something. So I would hope that all the members would take very seriously that what happens here in the Rules Committee, because these are the only two hearings that take place, that we used our brain, that we used our experience because we've all been home, We've been talking to people back home who, by the way, think there are other ways to get this done. And two of the good ideas have been thrown out today. But to write a rule so restrictive that we don't take in the good ideas from people who've been back home for 48 hours, I think would be a real mistake. So, Mr. Fazio, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, and I don't say this uh, in a political sense uh, of Republican versus Democrat. I voted for the bill. We need more people to vote for the bill. We need more people to decide one way or the other. And, and your alternative, I really like. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions, comments? Let me just correct the record, if I may, Mr. Sessions. There was a very extensive hearing held by the Judiciary Committee or the Financial Services Committee with both Mr. Paulson and Mr. Bernanke uh, in attendance. I think that lasted several hours. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Can I just yes, I shall. Because when Mr. LaTourette was here, he's a member of the Financial mm -hmm. Services Committee, and he said there was no, well, there may have been a hearing, there was no one on the bill. On the, I think that's the I think this is the bill. You, 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 know, you, didn't, you didn't make that point. There's no markup mm -hmm. on the bill, I think, is what Mr. LaTourette said, who's a member of that committee. Right. Well, you, could you give you one Yes. Work, but, I, I'm just curious. Is your minority leader asked for an open rule on this bill? Is I, that what you're saying to us? No, I'm not. I, I just, no, I'm just simply a gentleman. Yes, indeed. No, I, I'm just simply pointing out here that we had some testimony today, and there are just some some uh, some facts. I made well, the, I, I made the observation earlier on that the the only committee. In, in, in the House that has had a hearing on the bill is this committee. That's my my I, I, I understand that. I just, I just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to figure out where well, that's coming from. That's all. That well, you, you have the answer? Uh, no, I don't have to have oh. an answer. You okay. have a question. No, I just, wanted, I, just, I, was just, I just wanted to know if anyone knew the answer to that. Well, I, I think we'll have to ask that. Uh, okay, I will. Well, I, think, I think it's worth asking because I think the gentleman from Ohio is trying to pass the bill. Okay. And the gentleman from Ohio has his name 
straight up as trying to be one of the negotiators and trying to do the right thing for this country. And I think if you do dare to ask him, I think that given the opportunity to see what is on the table here at the Rules Committee, he's not here. I don't see the gentleman, Mr. Boehner, here. And giving him a chance to consider that and think about it, I'd like to get back with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeFazio. Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much uh, to the Rules Committee and again uh, for your hard work. Let me make it uh, very clear um, on reflection. I might suggest that all the members who voted uh, last Monday uh, voted uh, hopefully deliberatively and made decisions uh, that they thought were best for their constituency and for America. And I'd like to think that our presence here at the Rules Committee is equally that, even as I associate myself with the words of Mr. McGovern of where we have come from and how we have gotten to this point and uh, the difficulty that I have with uh, having this, uh, if you will, crisis peak more than a year ago and for this Congress to have just gotten this information from the administration and, and the secretary. And I hope that uh, we come to a point where we recognize that we have to solve this together. So my presence here today is frankly because I believe that there are some elements uh, that would, by tweaking it, uh, make this bill a better bill for the people who are, are less vocal. And those are uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones on Main Street of every congressional district who are facing foreclosure or part of the two million that are in foreclosure uh, who might have that uh, particular mountain to climb. And as you know, Madam Chair, and to the members, I offered a number of amendments uh, dealing with judicial review and uh, criminal malfeasance, uh, dealing with a commission and the bankruptcy provision that, by the way, on the floor of the Senate, uh, Senator Obama indicated that he was likewise interested in seeing the bankruptcy code, code uh, reformed, but I guess there was a problem in terms of those who might support it. So I have those, but I will offer two today that I would hope that might show the American people and, uh, and those who are facing this crisis themselves beyond the banks uh, that we are really focusing in this legislation on them. And might I just add that we are hearing that some of the regional banks are not as supportive of this legislation. Uh, I know that I spoke to my community bank and they indicated that they did not engage in these predatory uh, lending practices. So we do have sort of a divide in the markets, a divide in the money, in the money system between these larger banks and the smaller banks. But I would like to offer an amendment uh, that uh, particularly sets aside, as I indicated, about $10 billion that could be designated under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of the Treasury that would be utilized to help restructure the loans. Uh, this is a broad-based $700 billion, um, and there, are, there is language in there that services the mortgages, but it doesn't say what you could use. And this wouldn't be a cap. Uh, this would be a starting point, so that once this bill was passed, we would see that there would be certain mark, if you will, uh, that indicates that uh, those mom and pops are in the bill. Uh, that we are concerned about them, and we have this amount of money set aside, uh, which is obviously um, less than 10 percent of what we're asking for, what the uh, administration and secretary of the Treasury are asking for. A second amendment that I'd like to offer is, again, my concern with the language in Section 109, and I believe this is the same language in the Senate. It's now Section 109A, um, uh, which specifically uses the term encourage uh, and uh, to service these loans. I believe we should indicate uh, shall require uh, homeowners to restructure their mortgages to prevent foreclosures, to work with uh, this legislation uh, to be firm on how we're going to help those who are facing foreclosure, who may be in foreclosure. So the encouraging language, I think, could be much stronger by suggesting that they shall require. Again, I don't think any member who is being thoughtful, who's listened to their constituents, has any intent uh, to try to undermine the money markets of our nation. I think it is interesting that uh, they have uh, ensured in the Senate bill, I believe, uh, all of the, um, if you will, uh, money markets uh, uh, that don't really uh, lend uh, to the small business uh, and others in terms of credit, and that we are limited of 100%, I might say. The money markets are insured 100%, and the FDIC is only insuring uh, the uh, banking uh, uh, documents, savings, and uh, checking accounts uh, in our regular banks up to $250,000. That is an improvement 
but it doesn't equal to what the money markets are getting, and it's the banks that are lending the credit. So I just frankly believe that the more we can do to help those on Main Street, as we are doing, rightly so, uh, to improve the markets, is something that would make a very large statement uh, on uh, our efforts. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put my entire statement in the record. Without objection. And unanimous consent to put into the record a letter that I've written to the chairman of the Financial Services Committee and uh, CC to the leadership. Without objection. And so I ask my colleagues uh, to consider these amendments. Uh, and I also ask them to consider the fact that the Senate has now initiated revenue generating legislation. And I hope we can pull back our jurisdiction because I think that is enormously important. I think the Constitution vests that in the House, and I would hope that we would do so. And I hope that uh, as you do your work, we're all thinking about uh, all those uh, on Main Street that we all represent. And yes, I, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson Lee. Are there any questions, Ms. Witness? If there are none, I would thank you for coming. Appreciate that. And the, we will be in recess subject to the call of the chair. We, I don't know. We are hoping to try to get to the caucus and hear from our colleagues. But it won't be long. No, it, no I, and we'll get to you as quickly as we can. Absolutely. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said today that the Democratic leadership is still counting votes ahead of tomorrow.